Hey friends, welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. And I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we're so glad you joined us for this conversation. Let's dive in. Hey, David Thomas. Hey, Sissy Goff. I'm so excited to talk about resourcefulness with you. Me too. It feels so important today. And like a lost art in some ways. It does, which is why we might have a related project we might be working on that we won't tell anyone about. Top secret. Top secret. But just know, we feel like this one is really important, you guys. Really, really important. And boys and girls are very different when it comes to resourcefulness. Oh, they are. (laughs) So we might have some different things to say. I will illustrate. I've never told you this story. And I want to look at it because I I don't want to get it wrong. But so we were at Hopetown a couple years ago. And I was talking to a friend of mine who was in the second grade. And she said they did a school project on creating a business plan for whatever they wanted to. And so the girls made a plan for a clothing line, her group, a small group of girls. They made a plan for a clothing line, and they even looked into what kind of bags they needed to take to New York for when they were going to go to market, and they consulted a lawyer about what kind of plan they needed to come up with because one of their dads happened to be a lawyer. The boys (laughs) made a business plan for a fake restaurant that served tacos and bugs. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, yes, they did. I know. <laughs> That's so good. Now, let's fast forward that story into the future. You know this to be true, but I'll share this about me. That is an example of your friend's situation, that when I was in grad school, the field, as you and I both know, is predominantly female. And yes. so I went to school with all females. There were only three full-time males in my program. And so my three closest friends were all these are all these brilliant women. You know them, one we've even had on the podcast. And I just was thankful every time we were assigned a group project that I got to be in close proximity to them. And so they, we would have these brainstorming sessions at each other's house. And my wife jokingly said one time, what is your contribution to the group project? And I said, I carry the props. (laughs) So there you go. That's my version of the bugs and tacos. I talk to girls every day who hate doing group projects with boys. Of course they do. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know it carried into master's programs and that you're contributing to the problem, David. I would bring the snacks. You, I do that's wanna, good. That's I would not bring the snacks because the we problem. need some fuel yeah. for the programming. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Okay. Well, do you want to start us off as we talk about, why don't you throw out a stumbling block when it comes to boys and resourcefulness? I would love to, but you know what? I'm giving fellas a hard time. Let me say something really good and important and true about boys. And I put this study in the beginning of our chapter on resourcefulness in Are My Kids on Track? And I love this study. I I hadn't thought about it in a long time, and I love going back to it. So Michael Lewis did this study over 50 years ago. I'm going to read this. He's a developmental psychologist, and he researched gender differences using one-year-olds. So Lewis and his colleagues set up a barrier between a child and their mother. The barrier created physical separation, but the child was able to see the mother. So could see over the barrier, but couldn't get to her for the barrier. They then cued the mother to begin showing evidence of distress, so like some fake crying or signs. This is fascinating. I know. Most of the boys attempted to tear down the barrier, whereas most girls stood and wept. Lewis remarked on how the boys wanted to get back to their mothers, even if it required climbing over the barrier, knocking it down, maneuvering around the side, or pushing through like Superman to the rescue. On the other hand, the exercise immediately triggered an empathic response with the girls, Mm. who were also more likely to solicit help from another person. When the girls showed distress, their mothers emerged from behind the barrier and picked them up. And I put in the book, this is another example of what Sissy continues to talk about with girls. It's all about relationship Mm. and not just being in relationship, but being heard and understood in relationship. Females tend to be more process oriented and males tend to be more action oriented. 
Now, interesting. what I think is so important about that study and that we would see evidence of those instincts on the front side and why I said I want to say something really good about the fellas is that I think we as males are very action-oriented creatures and we are so often seeking solutions. And so I don't want us to miss the importance or the significance of that. It's where I think you and I in our work have to challenge a lot of dads to remember to just listen, particularly with their daughters, because they want to go straight to, well, here's what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And so my objective and all that would be, how could we appeal to a boy's desire to move toward action and solutions when we think about resourcefulness? Mm -hmm. So I love the part of them to this study that wanted to get around or push through mm-hmm. or find some kind of solution. Now, what's funny, if you read on into Michael Lewis's study, is that once they got to the other side with their mothers, they didn't quite know what to do with her crying or she seemed in distress. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, I got to you. I don't know what to do with this emotion right now. So all that, I think, is important as we think about wiring. And Sissy and I would certainly want to be clear in saying, again, as we've said before, there are exceptions to this rule. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of girls who are great at being action-oriented and solution-focused, and plenty of boys who wouldn't operate necessarily instinctively in those ways. But one thing that I do think is often instinctive, which is my stumbling block for boys, is I have an acronym and Are My Kids on Track for Boys, which is BAD. B-A-D. And it's not that boys are bad. Boys are so good. But bad stands for blame, avoidance, and denial. And boys can instinctively move toward those three left to their own devices. And I talk a lot about in raising emotionally strong boys, how boys swing between blame and shame. And blame is nothing more than discharge pain. It's, I'm going to point the finger out. It's, my sister made me mad. My teacher didn't teach it the right way. My coach didn't give me enough playing time. It's, always looking in the other direction rather than looking back. And that can really get in the way. All that pointing outward can really get in the way of me thinking, what do I need to do? What's Mm -hmm. my role? What's my responsibility in this? So what would you say is a stumbling Mm -hmm. block for girls when you think about resourcefulness? Well, I think that one certainly can be too, because I know girls who can fall in the bad lanes themselves David, I just got home from a beach trip with my cute nephews. It was so much fun. We got settled in the room and they unpacked their clothes, stuffies, Legos, and high vitamins. I love that they take them everywhere. They never leave home without them. Typical children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk growing kids should never eat. That's why Haya was created, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered chewable vitamin. While most children's vitamins are filled with five grams of sugar and can contribute to a variety of health issues, Haya is made with zero sugar and zero gummy junk. Yet, it tastes great and is perfect for picky eaters. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. It's non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. Haya is designed for kids two and up and sent straight to your door so parents have one less thing to worry about. That is one of my favorite things about Haya. But you know what my nephews love most? Having fun decorating the bottles with the stickers that come with the first order. And Haya just launched an awesome new collab. The same multivitamin that more than a million kids and parents love is now available in Barbie Pink with a limited edition Barbie unboxing experience, including Barbie bottle and Barbie stickers. You just made a lot of your clients very happy with that announcement. I also recommend checking out their new kids probiotic and nighttime essentials. We've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com slash RBG. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash RBG and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. I would say, and I want you all to hear this with so much grace, but I think one of the primary stumbling blocks 
today, maybe even more than when we wrote Are My Kids on Track, I think it's gotten more significant, are what I call in the book Paver Parents. And it's Mm -hmm. based on, I have a cousin named Blair who was like my brother growing up and still one of my favorite people on the planet. And he has raised three boys. So this is a boy dad quote, but he said, I feel like my job is to pave my boys for the road rather than pave the road for my boys. And I feel like I see more parents, would you agree, than oh, ever totally. who are wanting the road paved for their kids. And and you all hear us talk about this a lot. You know, of course, it feels like good parenting is to step in and pull your kids out of distress rather than doing the hard, patient work of remembering that stress inoculates kids against stress, which is one of the things we talk about a lot. And and my favorite visual on this, I will never forget. So we have a fundraiser called The Bike Thing. Well, now it's called The October Thing and we don't ride bikes anymore, partly because we don't get out and do hard things like this. And so we shifted our fundraiser even. And we used to go ride It started with 40 miles on the Natchez Trace. Then it dropped to 20 miles, partly because I came on staff and said 40 (laughs) miles is unreasonable. (laughs) Here I am contributing to the problem. And then it dropped to 10 10 miles, right? Five miles out, five miles back. And I, one of the last years, y'all, that that we had this, I was typically on this bike ride. It is a very hilly terrain. Very hilly. David was miles ahead of me every time. And I was usually in towards in the back. And there was one year where I was riding and I noticed this car staying really close to probably an 11-year-old girl. And there weren't really cars that were supposed to be on this portion of the trace when we were on this event. And this car was really dogging this, this bike rider. And I noticed there was a place right ahead of me that the car stopped. And this mother got out of the car for what must have been her daughter, and she picked up her bike and she put it in the trunk of her car. And I thought, oh, no, I hope the girl's OK. Well, I follow the car up the next hill and the mom pulls over and she gets out of the car and she gets her daughter's bike out of the car and she puts the daughter on it. And I follow the girl on her bike down the hill. And then I notice the mom pull over again put the bike in the car. And you all, every uphill, this mother drove her daughter up, got out, got the bike out and let her ride on the downhills, Mm. but drove her on the uphills. And I remember being so struck and thinking that feels like where we're going in a way that is to the detriment of our kids. Because then at the end of this 10 mile bike ride, we all gave medals to the kids and celebrated how hard they had worked. And I remember thinking, that girl knows. She watched these other kids do the hard work, and she knows she got away with not having to do it. And and she's still getting a medal. And, and that creates dissonance inside of her. And it creates a sense of, I don't deserve this. And I would even go as far as to say, it creates some knocks on our confidence. Yes. We want, y'all know we say it all the time, we want kids to know they can do hard things. And resourcefulness is built in not just hearing that message, but doing the hard things. And I, we ask this question all the time, and you have likely heard us say this, and I'm going to go back to it, because I would like for you to ask yourself this question once a month. What are two things right now you're doing for your kids that they can do for themselves? And what are two things you're doing for your kids that they can almost do for themselves? And I want you to stop doing all four. It's so important that we let them do hard things. You all, kids need to be doing new things, learning new skills at home, chores. They need to be growing in those places. Chores are really significant in creating resourcefulness in kids. There's so many different things that we can give them the opportunity to do and hold ourselves back, even in the struggle, even in the stress. It is so important Mm, for them. That's so good. Should we talk about some building blocks? Let's talk about building blocks. What would you say for fellas? You know, I would say if I were thinking about one of the remedies for blame or solutions that help boys develop beyond that, I talk a lot about the blame to shame swing and how the healthy middle ground is ownership. And we're Mm going to come to ownership when we get to the social milestones just to preview where we're headed. We'll talk more then, but... One of the ingredients of ownership is acceptance. I think that's a building block for boys. And that could come in the form of having to apologize to my sister and name what I did wrong. Or if we've had 
conflict and we both contributed. I named my contribution. And camping out in that space, writing an apology note to a friend that I've hurt their feelings, writing an apology note to a coach if I was disrespectful at a practice or a game. So opportunities where I think boys get to step into acceptance in some way, because I love Brene Brown's research when she talks about the difference between shame and guilt. And, you know, shame is believing I am wrong. Guilt is I did something wrong. And when we move toward acceptance, it is that acknowledgement of I did something wrong and I need to work toward repair. And so, you know, it's interesting we have talked a lot in the past about how in all the years we've done this work, some of the healthiest parents we've worked with are parents who are in recovery. Yeah. And I think it is transformative to have worked the 12 steps. And there is that acceptance that's within that, the acceptance of I'm powerless, the acceptance of I need God, I need community, I need people around me in order to continue to journey forward in sobriety and my recovery. And within the recovery community, there's a term that you may or may not have heard that is a dry drunk. And that would Mm -hmm. simply be a person who might have stopped the behavior of drinking, but they have all of the rage and all of the blame and all of the things. And we have seen a lot of evidence. In fact, it to me is one of the clearest indicators of someone who has not worked the 12 steps that you are still stuck in a lot of blame and pointing the finger. I sat with Mm. a dad the other day who he could not have been more critical of his wife throughout our Mm. consultation. And he was like, I stopped drinking, which is always... Making that declaration full of rage is always an indicator light for me, but it felt like he was embodying so much of what we're talking about, which didn't involve any acceptance, which Mm -hmm. didn't involve any um, acknowledgement of here's my contribution, here's where I've wronged you, and where we experience something so different with parents who've done that work. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've often said, I think it would be a great, healthy way for any one of us as human beings to live if we kind of operated every day from those principles of waking up and just acknowledging, I need God. I need people. These are the mistakes I make. These are the things I struggle with, like just operating from that posture in this world. And so I think to talk about this building block, the more boys practice acceptance and ownership, it transforms us in a way of I stop thinking so much about how I've been wronged and I think more about how I've wronged, mm. which both have happened in equal parts. Sometimes the I've wronged others more. And so I think the practice of those things is going to move me into more of the wisdom of Scripture where I stop being consumed with the thorn and I get really consumed with the log in my own eye. And so I think that's so vital and necessary. What would you mm. say for girls? I love that. I would say something else we talk about a lot, which are questions. And one of the things I read about when we were working, it's interesting, we're both talking a little bit about alcoholism, but when we were writing the book was something that I hadn't really thought about since graduate school, because I think it probably comes instinctive to us. It's a type of therapy called motivational interviewing, founded in the 80s and 90s to treat alcoholics. And like you have said, Folks that have worked through that are some of the most resourceful people we ever meet because they've had to learn to do hard things. So I want to read a description of motivational interviewing. This says, it's on page 109 in Are My Kids on Track? It says, ultimately, practitioners, you can insert parents here, practitioners must recognize that motivational interviewing involves collaboration, not confrontation. Evo- evocation, I don't even know how to say that word, like evoking evocation, not education, autonomy rather than authority, and exploration instead of explanation. Mm. I love that, exploration instead of explanation. And y'all, I just, I think we try to speak resourcefulness into kids a lot. We tell them what we think they should be doing, how they should be doing it, thinking they'll say, oh, okay, I'm going to get right on that rather than realizing they have got to connect the dots themselves to move toward resourcefulness in anything. And so the best way to help kids connect the dots 
One is letting him sit in the struggle and involves what we would consider a pain point in a business model. What's your pain point is that's what we're going to work towards remedying. And so letting them sit in a pain point and asking questions as to how to help them figure out how to get out of it. And so questions like, what do you want to see happen? What do you feel like would be helpful? What do you think God would want you to do? What's your heart telling you to do? Every time we ask a question, we're implying that we believe they're capable of figuring out the answer. And kids need to know that we believe they're capable of doing that. When we rescue them, when we, we talk about this a lot, that Often kids don't develop resourcefulness because we're so busy being the resources for them. When we're doing that, they don't believe they're capable and they don't learn. It's not what we're trying to communicate, but it is the message that is translated to kids. We want them to develop resourcefulness. So let's talk about some practical things. Sissy, can I brag on myself for a minute? Of course. I made a breakfast bowl this morning that was restaurant worthy. I almost called Bon Appetit to come take photos. <laughs> I'm sure they would have. You know what they would have photographed? My Our Place cookware. It is magazine worthy all the time. Mine too. That's why I leave it out on the stove 24 7. We have swapped all our toxic kitchenware for Our Place's non toxic, healthy, sustainable choices. I genuinely enjoy cooking more. And my cabinets are not as cluttered which makes this Enneagram One very happy. Did we mention that Our Place is healthy and PFAS free versus the industry? Did you know that most cookware and appliances are made with forever chemicals? Our Place is a mission-driven and female-founded brand that makes beautiful kitchen products that are healthy and sustainable. Their products are made without PFAS and PT, which is Teflon, Those are also things I do on road trips at restaurants, but I digress. In comparison, most of today's nonstick pans contain PFAS, also known as forever chemicals, which are under increasing global scrutiny for their impact on the environment and our health. Most cookware brands continue to use these chemicals due to their low cost. And did we mention they're beautifully designed in beautiful colors that feel like art objects that elevate any home and that make you feel creative in the kitchen? Find out why Our Place has 75,000 five-star reviews on their award-winning products, and they've been mentioned in the New York Times, Bon Appetit, and more. Go to fromourplace.com and enter our code RBG at checkout to receive 10% off site-wide. That's fromourplace.com, code RBG. Our Place offers a 100-day trial with free shipping and returns. So can mine even be kind of boy specific? Sure. I think some girls might struggle with this, but plenty of boys do. Yes. I sit with parents of boys of all ages all the time who will ask questions in some conversation or exchange and have a boy say, I don't know. And often I talk about how I don't know for a boy is an emotionally lazy response. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't want to brainstorm. I don't want to problem solve. I don't want to own my part. I don't want to do any thinking. I sure don't want to do any feeling. And so I think there's something important about pushing boys beyond. I don't know. And I think we can do that in a playful way. You know, I think it's great when we meet them with, you know, take your time, fella. You know, and then if he pushes back, like, I don't, I said, I don't know. I don't know. If we need to eat into your screen time, that is so fine. (laughs) Don't you worry at all. That's so good. But also calling out who they're capable of you know like you are a smart resourceful guy Mm. i know you've got some ideas in there i'm gonna give you a little time to sit with that i'm gonna give you a little time to think on that i'm gonna give you a little time to brainstorm around that that i think is fertile soil for building resourcefulness what would you say two things and actually two of the things that i think made me the most resourceful One is around the age of probably 12 or 13, I started learning to drive a boat. And at first, it was with that motor. There's some name for this. I don't know what it is. But the motors that you have to pull the thing out like a blower, you know, it's really hard to pull it out. And you hold it from, it's a 
outboard motor that's on the back. I'm sure there's a name. I don't know what it is. But that's how I learned on a little flat bottom fishing boat at our lake house and then moved to driving my dad's bass boat to move to driving the ski boat. And by the time I was in high school, I was taking my group of friends out skiing on a ski boat. And I think something about that, not everybody can take their kids. You're not on water. Can't take your kids to learn to drive a boat. But the fact that it was independent that it was out of the box. There weren't a lot of kids I knew who were doing it. It gave me so much confidence. And I have, we have a dear friend. I don't even know if I've told you this. I'm not going to say her name. But she and I have talked about that. And she, this summer, I was at Hopetown and I got a message from her. And she is, mm, we'll say early 40s. She called me and said, Sissy, I learned to drive a boat. And not only that, but my girls watched me learn to drive mm. a boat. So driving a boat, whatever the equivalent of that is in your life, number one. Number two, we're approaching the time, or we may be in it already when this comes out, that it is time to sign up for camp. And I want you to think about signing your kids up for camp. Whether it's a day camp, I believe overnight camps are even better. Dr. Michael Thompson, who we interviewed in a really great episode that we will link to in the show notes, said the best part of camp is that you're not there. And at camp, you are doing archery, you're riding horses, you're playing, I don't, polo lacrosse was offered at my camp. You're doing things that you don't do in any other space often. You're having to build relationships. You're putting yourself in a lot of places you wouldn't be otherwise. And again, without your parents cheering you on, which parents, I want you to be cheering your kids on. It's so important to have your voice in their lives doing that. But it's so great when they're in spaces where you can't and where they just have to do it and figure it out. And I think camp is a beautiful space for that. And as we have talked about a lot, it's one of the remaining places, the last few places that they have zero access to screens. And if you are thinking about sending your kids to a camp where they allow screens, don't do it. They need to be there without screens. So I think that's a huge resourcefulness builder. So find a camp that you trust. And I and I, I I need to go ahead and say on here, we have had more registrations for our little camp since this podcast started from out of town. And you all, we have a really wonderful camp for the kids that are in counseling in Nashville at Daystar called Hopetown. So I would say sign your kids up for Hopetown. But there are a lot of really amazing camps all across our nation. And I just heard someone recently say they sent their kids to camp in Mexico. I'd like to go to camp in Mexico. <laughs> Me too. Thanks, y'all, for listening. We are cheering you on. Your kids can do it. They can grow resourcefulness. David, what a team we have that we get to call friends who help make this podcast possible. Amanda Young, our operations manager. Chris Starrett, our engineer. Our management team at H Squared. We are thrilled to be a part of the That Sounds Fun Network. Our music was created by the insanely talented Dave Haywood of Lady A. And if this podcast felt helpful to you, please consider subscribing, liking, sharing, all the things. We are grateful for you and cheering you on always. Always.